Happy Sunday morning and welcome to another episode of Collider Mailbag. This is a very special episode. I'm your host, John Roca, but I am welcoming this director of programming here at Collider, this new guest to Collider Mailbag, and a guy we all have come to know and love and, of course, talk about numerous times on multiple uh, uh, videos that we've done here at Collider, Thad Williams. Welcome to the show. Well, hi there, John. It's nice to be here. Today's my birthday. Happy so birthday. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. It's a <laughs> wonderful birthday present. It's everything I would have wanted. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah. we'll see by the end of the show if you feel the same way. Uh, but it's great It's great to have you on because we always talk about films off camera. So it's fun to have you on to talk about it now on yeah. camera so people know for sure what you think. He isn't just, you know, uh, directing our program. He also knows a lot about this stuff. So. Ah, I wouldn't. Nah, we'll, we'll see about we'll that. We'll find out. We'll see about that. It's <laughs> early on in the episode. <laughs> well, you guys know how the show works. We get your questions. You send them in when we put the call out on social media. When Dorian does that, you put the hashtag there, Collider Mailbag, on your questions. Makes it easier for me to find. I pick them out and pick out like 20 to 25. Send them on to my guest. They pick out five that they like, and then we talk about it on the show. You can also email us at mailbag at collider.com. That's mailbag at collider.com. Pour through those as well to compile that list of 20 to 25. And that I think you've picked five really good ones for us to talk about. Well, I, I thought I'd pick pretty well, too. So yeah, we'll oh. see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, that's the level of uh, confidence you're dealing with, <laughs> yeah. folks. Let's do this. All right. Our first question comes from Twitter. It's from at Johnny J L 96. I'm not sure what that means. He asks, what do you think about Greg Frazier for the cinematographer of the Batman movie that was just announced this week so he's asking what do you think what do you think uh, i think it's a really good choice i mm -hmm. mean he he was the dp on rogue one yeah uh, which i thought was a fantastically shot film he mm -hmm. also did zero dark 30 yeah and uh, and then some smaller stuff like uh uh fox catcher yes so i think his pedigree is certainly there mm -hmm. uh i'm really curious to see what the tone of the batman movie is going to be i know we've heard like detective noir mm -hmm. kind of thing uh, we still don't really know what the time period is, if right. it's going to connect to Joker in any way or the larger DC film universe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the addition of Frazier with Matt Reeves behind the, behind the camera, I think is a really good combo. No, I think you mentioned what kind of style of film we're going to get. And Greg Frazier, as you mentioned from the numerous projects that he's done, you can throw Vice in there. He's yeah. doing, he's doing Dune for Denis Villeneuve as well. He did Lion. That nice, oh, wow. uh, that, that interesting film that came out as well, and killing them softly. So, what's the pr what's the prevailing thing? Yeah. Except for maybe Dune is smaller, grittier, dirtier type of films, yeah. city based films, that kind of stuff. So that tells you the. I think to me, it gives you a window into where Greg, uh, Matt Reeves rather, is going with the Batman, and he wants that cinematographer that can really capture that. And it excites me even more that he's picking Greg Frazier because of the projects that he's done before. Even Rogue One, although it's an expansive with numerous worlds when the battle scenes are happening or when the the espionage stuff is happening it's dirtier it's grittier it's smaller the ca yeah. camera is right there yeah it's they kind of I, I mean you could i think you could argue that it's the, probably the most dynamic filmmaking that's done in the star wars universe absolutely uh at least from a visual standpoint mm -hmm. uh but i think that the two of them together i'm really interested to see uh where yeah where they take this if they if they go with that gritty vibe uh we haven't seen dune but i assume dune mm -hmm. is kind of like you know large vistas yeah uh kind of a lawrence of arabia vibe uh compared to his other other work right. so uh, i'm really curious to see where that lands if, the, if you're hiring him for what he's known for mm -hmm. or if you're trying something new yeah yeah we'll see certainly an exciting choice uh what's our next question uh well our next question is an email from steve f uh steve says hello roca and annoying unwatched Watchable guest. Oh, that that would be me. How dare uh, you? Yeah, it's fine. He says he's kidding. It's fine. Okay, good. Uh, I've always been curious. <laughs> after main photography and shooting a movie is wrapped, the cast depart and they go their separate ways. What happens after going over the footage and editing, and they need to reshoot scenes? Surely the sets and crew aren't just waiting around to see if they're needed again. Do they build entire sets again just to shoot another scene? Are the actors legally obligated to come back and do more scenes, even if they're on set for another movie? What movies had the latest, most last minute reshoots you've ever heard of? And if you know scenes that were reshot, do you think they made or broke the movie? Lots of questions in there. Yeah, that's a question. So let's take, I'm not gonna take them all one by one. I think they're all wrapped into themselves. So you'll say this, what usually happens, I think it's in the contract for most yes. films now Nowadays, with the, uh, the actors to say you have to be back for this reshoot, I think they give them a window with which they'll do the reshoot, so the actors plan for that and aware are aware of that. Uh, as far as sets go, I think they save the sets until they officially wrap 
the movie in a warehouse somewhere so they don't have to rebuild them, as you said, because the cost would be yeah. astronomical. You know yourself, uh, having done some sets yeah. in your lifetime. Yeah. So. They, they definitely they save them whenever they can. Uh, in fact, uh, David Sandberg has been putting out a bunch of really, really great uh, behind-the-scenes looks into Shazam on oh, his YouTube channel. Wow. And I think there are special features on the Blu-ray as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think he actually references that some parts of the additional photography for that film uh, such as the interior of the foster home ah. had to be rebuilt from scratch because they had already gotten rid of the set and it oh, wasn't wow. until after the fact that they realized that they needed to shoot there right so uh, you know it does depend on the movie and the location as far as whether or not they have to recreate things sometimes they're done on green screen mm -hmm. sometimes uh they they'll just build one wall so they can just punch in uh to a close-up and 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 fix the scene right because uh, I mean, reshoots uh, reshoots have gotten a bad rap over the years. Sure. But additional photography is necessary uh, uh, for most filmmaking until you really get into the editing room mm -hmm. uh, and realize how you're crafting the story. Because most of the story is made in the editing room, and yeah. when you're there, you realize how you're actually going from point A to point B, and a lot of times you're missing a piece or two yeah. to get there. So I think that. The actors are usually on call. Uh, sometimes they have to work out their other schedules. Famously, mm -hmm. we had the the Cavill mustache yes. fiasco because he was obligated to come back and shoot for Justice League, but he was on the hook for Mission Impossible, which was delayed because of Tom Cruise's injuries. Mm -hmm. So there was a big problem that Paramount and Warner Brothers had to figure out on like a macro level. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think Cavill just was like, just tell me where to go. I'll do whatever you need me to do. But there were a lot of other moving parts uh, in that situation. Yeah, so yeah. it really depends on the film. Uh, I mean, when, when the reshoots are kind of made, if the reshoots are made kind of with the, you know, the studio overlords mm -hmm. deciding that they don't like the ending of a movie and they have to redo the ending or whatever, sometimes that doesn't really work. But for the additional photography side of things, yeah. I think it's really necessary to go in and out and to really kind of get those little beats that will help you better craft the story or at the very least if you've already know what the story is to really kind of hone down and get those few shots that you need to really kind of yeah. make it work together and make it feel cohesive. Exactly. And you talk about legally obligated. We look at New Mutants, right? That's something that oh. they've done numerous reshoots now on this film. And Just League 2, I mean, my friend is uh, my uh, a friend of mine as a camera assistant, she's good friends with K Kieran Hines. They went and did three separate rounds of reshoots yeah. on that damn movie. So there's a lot that goes into it. You look at New Mutants, kind of the same thing, multiple reshoots. And we had those quotes recently where they are bringing that whole cast back together to do reshoots for the New Mutants. Yeah. Yep. And it was like it was easier. They were saying it was easier for uh, the MC for Marvel and for Disney to get them all back together to do it. That is that's one of those unusual cases where the reshoots are so far out and the movie still hasn't come out and they keep delaying it and delaying it where it starts to become a legal thing. And that's where as an actor, you have a little more leverage to get a little more money out of that situation True. because you're changing your entire schedule to make that happen. And most actors aren't legally obligated. But if you've shot that much on a movie, you kind of want the movie to come out. So you'll make the time if you can. Yes, and, yeah. and 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 more often than not, I think you the director is one of those positions where if if for some reason the director is not available, and this is true more on the TV side, yeah, they they legally have to like for DGA rules they have to offer it to the director, right? And then the director gets like first refusal if they're busy mm -hmm. to then give it to a second unit team or right. you know sometimes there's situations where people like Ron Howard are brought in and 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 the whole thing gets changed, <laughs> but yeah. but yeah, I mean speaking of Star Wars, yeah. you know there 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 was news coming out this week that they're reshooting. Yep. They're doing additional shots on Star Wars all the way up until September. 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 And, you know, and the Avengers famously shot that post credits tag scene mm -hmm. during the red carpet yeah like the week of the like the week of the red carpet premiere because that's one scene because that was just one little it's one tag. scene yeah right but exactly. like, you know it, it can be done it can be done until the last second especially mm -hmm. these days with technology they don't have to go get the film developed exactly people they can work, they can drop a shot in no matter what and people work 24 hours on that team because there's money and yeah. work it overtime as well and they'll make it all happen in that way all right let's move on to our next question it's an instagram question from sam robinson he asks what is a very underappreciated sports movie that needs to be revisited by online websites in order to promote its reappreciation that 
Uh, well, obviously D3. No, uh, <laughs> Muddy Ducks 3. No. Uh, oh, shit. Just kidding. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, though I will agree that the photo uh, used in, the, in, that, in that question oh, was, yeah. for, uh, was, was for the arm kid. The arm yeah, kid. Uh, yeah. what, what is is that it remember? the rookie? The r- rookie of the year. Rookie of the year. The there rookie it is, yeah. was with uh, Dennis, Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid, right. That was with Dennis Quaid. But uh, rookie of the year, great movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say um, my choice for this would be Miracle. Okay. I think Miracle was a fantastic hockey film, really well done, great performances from the whole t- from the whole cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, really kind of got it overlooked that year. I, I can't remember if there were there was another big sports movie that came out in that in that year mm-hmm. year and a half time period. But it kind of came and went without a lot of fanfare. Uh, and I I would say if you haven't seen it or if it's been a while, you should revisit Miracle because I think it's a really great film. That's a great point. It's essentially, it's essentially kind of Hoosiers on ice because you have a yeah. lot of new actors playing these these iconic characters. And then you have a, a hard grizzled uh, coach like Herb Brooks played by Kurt Russell there, yeah. like Hackman was in Hoosiers. So yeah, that's definitely a film that people don't appreciate enough. You mentioned Rookie the uh, the Rookie. That's certainly one yeah. that a lot of people don't go back to and revisit, even though it's a fantastic film. I would throw in Warrior the Gavin O'Connor film. It's an sure. MMA film, so already a niche market for that. Not a lot of people going to see an MMA film, but some fantastic performances from Joel Edgerton, from Tom Hardy, from Nick Nolte in there, Jennifer Morrison as well. A lot of people in that movie, and it's fantastic from uh, top to bottom. It's kind of one of those kind of gritty man films that you want to go see every once in a while, <laughs> and maybe it didn't get as much love as it should have. And Tin Cup is another one. I love oh, Tin yeah. Cup to yeah. pieces. Yeah. yeah? That's a real, I, I love most Kevin Costner sports movies. Yeah. Uh, but this one is his, his, him going back to as close to yeah. Silverado as he's ever going to get. Okay. That kind of okay. laid back, funny dude where it doesn't take anything too seriously. Uh, and I really enjoyed seeing Costner not be in control of a movie <laughs> as he usually is sure. and kind of defaulting to Rene Russo or Cheech Marin and his, of course, his rival in the film, Don Johnson, who I talked to on the deep cut. If you ever want to listen to that interview, that's a fun, fun movie. And he is so relaxed and great and that it makes you forget uh, that he can do those roles when he wants to. Fair enough. What's yeah. your what's your favorite Costner baseball movie? Oh, uh, it has to be Field of Dreams. Okay. Even though I don't know if it's necessarily a baseball movie. Fair. You that's know that's fair. that's how I argue that because there's no competition in the actual movie. It's not it's not about the sport right. so much. It it is more about the love of the game, unlike mm-hmm. the movie for the love of the game, which didn't really work. <laughs> but no. uh, but I mean I yeah, because I would say I, w- I would kind of go Bull Durham as even though I think, I, think, have to. I think Field of Dreams is probably my favorite right. sport related film of all time. Right. And, I mean, it's all about family and fatherhood mm-hmm. and everything else. But but uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. For love of the game, if you had taken out all the, the <laughs> scenes with Kelly Pratt, like the love story at all, I think the film would be great. If you yeah. just take out that and it's a it's an old pitcher's uh, final shot getting a no-hitter in a game like that with John C. Reilly as his catcher, there's something really great in just that. You don't need the love story right. necessarily. So, I don't know. That's what I would say. All, All right, right, what's our next question? Uh, well, the next question is another email, this time from Jonathan Charles. Uh, he writes, uh, hey, uh, hello, Roka, and esteemed guest. See, oh, I'm esteemed now. You got elevated. Uh, esteemed guest. With the new Blade movie announced, do you think we will get a Wesley Snipes appearance? Look, do I think <laughs> it'll happen? Probably not. Do I want it to happen? Yes, with every fiber of my being. I think it all depends on the story. Does yeah. he is he the new whistler? Does he take the Chris Christopherson role and kind of educate this kid? Maybe he finds this kid who is a blade and like, you know, he, he thought he was the only one. We saw that in Into the Spider-Verse when there's a new Spider-Man and Spider-Man sees Miles Morales. That's certainly possible. So he could be his guide, uh, guiding light in that sure. way and teach him the business and teach him what to use, what not to use, all this kind of But again, then, then again, Maharshala Ali is already in his 30s. So does he radiate like new kid on the block? not knowing what to do yeah. it'll be interesting if they work it in and make it happen i would love it if they did it but then again i don't know yeah i mean there's the other there's the other possibility with uh, his you know his his estranged father that he didn't ever knew he had that's right it cross yeah Luke, cross. Luke cross yeah so i mean but i don't know if the ages really line up for mm-hmm. that if 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 it because Herschel is in his 30s wesley's what in his 50s, 50s yeah, yeah. Certainly mid-50s. so i mean it, it could be done uh i i don't really think that Marvel's going to do that because yeah. I don't know if they really want to highlight the previous iteration as much. Great point. Uh, I feel like they're wiping the slate clean in the same in the same respect that you wouldn't really ever see older uh, previous members of the X-Men in whatever mm-hmm. version of the mutants that we get in 22 or 23 or 25 or whenever yeah. they happen. Uh, I, 
I could maybe a cameo from Wesley would be kind of fun. Uh, I just I I don't see Marvel really dipping into that well at you know, all. You could make an argument though, Thad, if you look at another film trilogy series, which the third film didn't do that well, and that's Spider Man. They brought Jay Jonas and Jameson back as JK that's Simmons true. as Jay Jonah in the in the end of uh, Far From Home. So it's possible it just i just wonder where they would work him in that would feel organically seamless because the jay joan reveal was fantastic yes can you do that with wesley i, don't I mean know. well by that token would we just see steven dorf show up <laughs> i mean he and mahershala work together have That's you seen true. that wonderful meme yeah. uh, about the two of them working together yes uh with, with the guy that plays cyborg in the doom patrol yeah yeah ray uh, fisher yeah. yeah uh yeah so We'll see. We'll see. I, I got. I, I don't think it's gonna happen. Yeah, I don't think I, so. Either, don't but. don't cash that check too soon, Wesley. Right. And if you do cash it, pay your taxes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Sound advice. All right. Our last question. It's an Instagram question. It comes from QT's fan. Asks, do you think Tarantino's recent comments about possibly doing another Kill Bill film mean that this will be his tenth movie, or will it be Star Trek that is his tenth movie? That. I. Th I I don't see a scenario where Quentin actually directs a Star Trek film. Right. I just really don't think it's ever going to happen. I know he just did a podcast recently during this press tour for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I haven't seen yet, so okay. I don't know. No spoilers. I don't know how that lands in terms of uh, dipping. I know there's lots of tonally, a lot of things that reference his previous films mm, and things. True. Uh, but I could see Kill Bill 3 coming about. Uh, I don't see Star Trek really happening. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, frankly, if the film is ever going to get made, let alone if he would direct it. Yeah. Because uh, the podcast that he just talked about, the movie again, he re is referencing that he wants to use Pine and Quinto. Uh -huh. And the fourth movie fell apart because Pine and Hemsworth couldn't agree on salary. So I don't know if Pine's even into it anymore. Right. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions in terms of how he wants to mess with the canon, uh, which he's free to do whatever he wants with it, as far as I'm concerned. But I just don't see the stars aligning for a Star Trek film directed by Quentin Tarantino. And if yeah. so, it certainly wouldn't be the last film he's ever made. Yeah, that's a, it would be a weird swan song to have it be a Star Trek film. A, because it's not really a premier franchise anymore like it used to no. be. So it'd be, a, although to both of our chagrins, it's not. But like, it, it's, I, I think the what you bring up at the beginning of your point, that makes sense. He could write it, not necessarily direct it. But he's not even writing this. Yeah, he's they not have somebody even, yeah. else doing the script yeah. based on his idea. I yeah. just don't see, mm. I don't, I, I just don't see this happening. I, yeah. I, I, I feel like he's just his usual crazy interview where he's just kind of talking stream of consciousness right although uh, in th like in the moment when he said it he certainly believed it that's the kind of stream of consciousness he is true but i agree with you i think kill bill volume three is more l a likely scenario especially because after that uh these issues that were brought up between uma and him in that interview she did last year yeah. they kind of smoothed them over i saw on her instagram today because i follow her that she wished a tarantino a great opening weekend for the film so that's all patched up can you bring her back kind of bring her back into prominence would be fantastic even maybe even weave in maya who is her daughter I, I just who's gonna... in once upon a time in Hollywood, yeah. it'd be nice to have them kind of be in this situation with maybe Vivica A. Fox's daughter, who, you know, there was a reference to that at the end of, or in, the, in that fight scene in Kill Bill. So that seems more likely. That's a greater swan song, I think, than doing a Star Trek, if he's really going to stop at 10. Yeah, and all, the, the whole 10 thing is ridiculous. Yeah, it it's is. like, you know, I mean, Soderbergh said he was going to retire too. Everyone says they're going to retire. Yeah. They go away for a little while, and then they keep making other stuff just on their own terms. Right. I, and also, he's... This is this new film. This is his first studio project, right? With Once Upon a Time, I feel like that's gonna, if it is a success at the box office, is gonna breathe new life into his career mm -hmm. in ways that he didn't really even realize were possible. Yeah, and so I could totally see him blowing through ten, nine, eleven, uh, like. 10, 11, 12, you, you count up, not down, uh, when you're counting. Uh, 10, 11, 12, <laughs> I can see him just doing more and more movies as he sees fit. And yeah. if one of them's Kill Bill 3, I will be there opening night Absolutely. without without a doubt. Yeah, like, yeah, agreed. I, if it's Star Trek, I'll probably still be there opening night, but I'll, I'll be clenching my fist the whole time. <laughs> I think you'll feel more like the, the, the Kill Bill Volume 3 could be the end, whereas if you went to Star Trek, you're like, there's no way this is the end. There's right. going to be more. So yeah. we'll see. But either way, it's exciting. Either project he chooses, 
it would be fun to see what the results are, even though I don't, I don't know if I 100% like it. Uh, all right, well, thanks, everybody, for watching this episode of Collider Mailbag. Always appreciate you all taking the time to watch the show, or maybe you're just listening to the show on YouTube because you can't get it on podcast form anymore. Appreciate it either way. I want to thank Thad Williams for coming on the show. Thank you, Thad. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Where can people find you, man? Uh, you can find me at Thad Williams, and I'm also uh, one of the co-hosts of Collider TV Talk over on the Collider Factory every Thursday. That's right. Always breaking out all the fun TV shows that are going on out there. Uh, and you can always find me at The Rogue Says as well on Twitter and on Instagram. And remember, next week when we put the calls out for those uh, questions, look for them on our social media. Put that hashtag Collider Mailbag on them or email us, email us rather at mailbag at collider.com. Always appreciate that. Have yourself a great rest of your Sunday. Thanks to Cody Hall in the booth over there. And we'll talk to you next week with two episodes of Collider Mailbag.